It's about carbon dioxide, it's about other greenhouse gases, and it's about um, what we do into the future. And we have choices, we have choices that we're making right now. And one is to do nothing, and that would be a choice. But there are consequences of that choice, and the models that we use to predict the future demonstrate that if we do nothing, we're looking at four degrees of global warming by the end of this century and 80 centimetres of sea level change. And that is a profound um, a modification to the way that we inhabit our, our planet. And as I said, with, with all sorts of implications for water and for um, uh, energy and food uh, and the way that we live and the inter um, geopolitical tensions that will result from those things. The other choice is that we decide to reduce our carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions. We look at cleaner, more renewable sources of energy. We modify our power system and we make our cities more inhabitable and more sustainable into the future. Yes, I think we should be worried. There is scientific consensus that this is an issue um, and we need to get that message out to the public and to governments. And so um, climate change, in, from my perspective, as a flood, flood modeller, a flood forecaster and a drought forecaster, is essential to understand what's going to happen to that flood risk and that drought risk in the future. And we think it's going to get worse, both in the UK and worldwide. Well, I think we should not spend too much time being worried. I think we should do something. Um, I mean, it is a big issue because it will change so many things. And there are many things, particularly if we, if we do nothing, if we keep on with business as usual um, and go way, way above the two degree um, target, then the consequences are largely unknown. But um, to some extent, they're rather obvious. Uh, sea level is going to carry on rising, and that's going to be very, very expensive to fix. So my work is on climate change and extreme weather, and I think we should be worried. But I think a consideration of, of whether extreme weather will change in the future overlooks a basic point, that we're not sufficiently resilient to extreme weather now. And if we were better protected against the risks we currently face, that would put us in a much better position to withstand the impacts of climate change. We take it very seriously. We see the impacts of climate change on a daily basis. Uh, in the, it's our customers uh, that are impacted by it. We see uh, a massive increase in the frequency and severity of extreme weather events, and they're climate linked. Climate change is a big factor for us, particularly when coupled with population growth. Uh, huge numbers of people projected to move to London in the next 25 years. They're all going to want water, they're all going to want their toilets to flush and the waste to go away when they want it to. So climate change is a factor particularly around water supply. We've got to supply 9 million people at the moment with water every day. And it's also a risk around flooding. And when we take the wastewater away through our sewers, if they overflow, of course that causes problems too. So both uh, the weather is fundamental to our business and weather is only a subset of, of climate um, and, and that really matters to us. Well, I think the first thing to say about COP21 is how it's different to, to previous attempts at finding uh, global consensus about greenhouse gas emissions. So Copenhagen uh, in 2009 was regarded as a failure, um, and it probably was, but then probably the intentions of that conference were too ambitious to get some agreement that was universally legally binding on greenhouse gas emissions was, was unrealistic at that time. But things have moved on and we learned our lessons and what we have now are intended nationally determined contributions uh, that individual nations will put onto the table as a commitment on their carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas reductions into the future. Uh, and it's certain that we'll get those. Um, don't know what the outcome of that will be, but there will be something and it will be a step in the right direction. It might be that it's totally sufficient to, to what we need and in that situation, you know, that will be wonderful and it will be a major achievement. People think it's unlikely that it does that. And so the, the next question is, given that the commitments might be less than we believe is what's needed, the next important question is, what are the ratcheting mechanisms that are available to take where we are after Paris to where we need to be in the, in the coming years and decades after that? Success from COP21 will, will be a ro at least being able to see clearly what the roadmap is to a comprehensive climate agreement that limits global warming to under two degrees C. So I think this event has, you know, it's, it's been, been helpful in encouraging nations to think about what they actually can do. And of course, um, some countries already have made very important announcements, and the most important of all is that of China. I'm really not an expert on the politics of this, and, and I'm not sure what to expect from the US. Um, I think the US is 
Well, there's, there's two highly relevant points here. One, one is that um, among major um, emitters of CO2, uh, the U.S. is a country that has succeeded in reducing its emissions uh, more than most nations, um, basically by fracking. Uh, I know this is controversial. The point is, if you know, if if you're serious about um, if you're serious about emissions reductions, you have to do what can be done, and the U.S. have really shown the way. The agreements themselves are fundamental. If we can have those agreements and they are publicised well to the public uh, and to business uh, and industry. I think that will make the difference between getting some of these initiatives off the ground and not. So um, things like global flood forecasting systems and the links to the local populations. If we've got the agreements behind them, then um, the political will is there to implement these adaptation measures. I'm very optimistic about COP21. Uh, I, I, whoever you speak to, there, there does seem to be you know, a positive tone that something positive will be agreed. Um, I, I think it's a different approach to, to Copenhagen and you know if, if countries are coming with their intended uh, uh, actions and limits then you can see there's going to be greater buy-in. Um, I just think that whilst you don't want discussion on the actions to prevent agreement, you know, there needs to be a, a ratcheting mechanism which you know, builds on, reduces um, those, those, those committed emissions and tries to sort of accelerate a reduction of carbon emissions. We'd like to see a clear sense of direction, recognition by political leaders as well as um, the, the business community and the environmental community that climate change is real and is happening and uh, what we're going to do about it so that we have a clear set of targets which can then be transmitted through political and economic decisions in a way that businesses can plan consistently, uh, not just for the next few months or the next few years, but over the long term.